Let's pray. Bless you, Father. Lord, we thank you for your presence here this morning. Lord, we thank you, Father, for your the grace, the power of your love, Lord. Yes. Lord, we just uh, ask your word to be blessed this morning, Father, Lord. It's a privilege and an honour, Lord, to serve you and to preach to your people, Lord. I just pray uh, your word has its effect this morning, Father, and that it's, it is like a sword, Father, and it's also like a scalpel, Lord, and it does cut deep. We pray for this this morning, Father, that each of us will be touched by the words that you have to say and uh, your power and authority on them, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and 10. Paul was talking about the visions that he was, he, he was given from the Lord and at one stage he talks about this person that was taken up into the third heaven which we all think was himself. But to keep me from being puffed up with pride because of the many wonderful things I saw, I was given a painful physical ailment. This is the Living Bible. Which acts as Satan's messenger to beat me and keep me from being proud. Three times I prayed to the Lord about this and asked him to take it away. But his answer was, my grace is all you need, for my power is greatest when you are weak. My grace is all you need, for my power is greatest when you are weak. I am most happy then to be proud of my weaknesses. In order to feel the protection of Christ's power over me, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions and difficulties for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Another scripture says, um, let the um, weak say I am strong. Let the weak say I am strong, let the poor say I am rich. We're all crackpots, people. And... Um, one of the advantages of being a crack pot is when you put a light inside it, it comes out the cracks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, we are all poor one way or the other. The greatest gift that the Lord has given us is eternal life and forgiveness of sins. We cover ourselves with the blood on the post beside the door and above the door. We're covered by the blood if the Israelites hadn't sacrificed the lamb on that particular night when they were told to, if they hadn't have covered the doorposts with the blood, the angel of death would have taken them out. And that is the promise that we have. It's not what I'm talking about this morning, but I was impressed by that while I was sitting there taking communion. A lot of times, we don't feel good enough. Most of the time, actually. And we're in bodies that cause us strife and we get, we get sanded down. We are pitted up against ourselves. And, and often that's the best thing for us. It's nobody else that we are, are, are compared to, but the Lord uses ourselves, our own physical selves, who we are, our upbringing, whatever, to shape us. And that will happen continually until the Lord comes to take us home. It is the best product and the best way for, for this all to happen. I often say to people that I'm an RACE. I'm an RACE. What does that mean? It's a renovation application coding engineer. <laughs> <laughs> renovation application coding engineer. Race. And that's me, a painter. I paint houses. But we are all RACEs in the Lord. We are all renovation application coding engineers. Because God has taken us through this school of training and given us the qualifications to be an engineer for his glory. And we're in the race. We are race, RACE, in the race. We're all qualified. But not what I was going to speak about this morning. What I want to speak about is 
a little bit about Gideon. Now, if you bear with me, I've got the story here on the, on the paper. The Israelites did evil. This is in uh, Judges 6. In the eyes of the Lord, and for seven years he gave them into the hands of the Midianites. Because the power of Midian was so oppressive, the Israelites prepared shelters for themselves in the mountain cliffs, caves, and strongholds. Whenever the Israelites planted their crops, the Midianites, the Amalekites, and other eastern peoples invaded the country. They camped on the land and ruined the crops all the way to Gaza, did not spare a living thing for Israel, neither sheep, nor cattle, nor donkeys. They came up with their livestock in their tents like swarms of locusts. It was impossible to count them or their camels. They invaded the land to ravage it. Midian so impoverished the Israelites that they cried out to the Lord for help. And this is something that happens right through the Bible in the Old Testament. Israel goes wrong, they cry out to the Lord, the Lord comes and, and, and helps them out. When the Israelites cried out to the Lord because of Midian, he sent them a prophet, and the prophet said, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I brought you up out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. I rescued you from the hand of the Egyptians. I delivered you from the hand of all your oppressors. I drove them out before you, gave you their land, and I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not worship the gods of the Amorites in whose land you live. But, and there's always a but, you have not listened to me. <laughs> the angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in Ophrah that belonged to Joas, the Abbey's right, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat and wine press to keep it from the Midianites. So they had to hide the process of, of their wheat because if the Midianites found it, they'd just kill them and take, the, take all, the, all the stuff. And when the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. I want you to think about this. The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. How do you think Gideon felt? Here he was, hiding away there, thrashing the wheat out, in case he got caught. And this angel says, mighty warrior. So Gideon says, pardon me, but if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, Did not the Lord bring us out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us under the hand of Midian. The Lord turned to him and said, or the angel, Go in strength and have... <coughs> go in strength. You have the strength you have and save Israel. Go in the strength you have, save Israel. Out of Midian's hand, am I not sending you? And of course, what else can you say? He says again, pardon me, Lord, <laughs> but how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, which was his tribe, and I am the least in my family. I am the least in my family. So God uses the least. Yes. Right through the Bible, from David right through, he uses the least. He uses the weak. He confounds the wisdom of the wise by using the foolishness of preaching, which I'm doing this morning, to get his message out to get people saved. He uses the foolishness. He uses the weak to confound the strong. He uses the poor and beggarly things of this world to impress his word and his salvation message upon people. And here he was, he's using the least of the family. And the Lord answered, I'll be with you and you will strike down all the Midianites, leaving none alive. What he's doing is building up Gideon's faith. Gideon didn't think much of himself. But God can use you when you're like that. That's the message this morning is that God can use you. And he is willing and desirous to use you regardless of what you think of yourself. Often we come along and we, we take communion and often we don't. We sit there because we might have done something wrong yesterday or we don't feel very good about ourselves or we had a hard week. So we think, no, I'm not good enough to take communion. Now that's rubbish. That's what communion's for. That's what the blood's for. God uses the weak and beggarly things. And the scripture I read in 2 Corinthians there, Paul was weak and he rejoiced. 
He rejoiced. He learned that it doesn't matter how you feel. I don't feel like Billy Graham this morning. I don't feel like for any of those other great preachers up there this morning. I am me in my week in Biggerly State. And I'm preaching the gospel and serving the king. My sermon's probably going to be written in a book up there. And it'll be there forever. Your sermons, each of your sermons, are written in a book and a page. And they'll be there forever. We're serving the king. Gideon replied, if now I have found favour in your eyes, give me a sign that it is really you talking to me. Please don't go away until I come back and bring an offering. So he said, go and do it. So Gideon went inside, he prepared a, a young goat, and he made some bread, and he, and he bought a broth, and he bought it to the angel, and the, God said, the angel of God said, take the meat and the unleavened bread, place it on this rock, pour out the broth, and Gideon did so. Angel of the Lord touched the meat and the unleavened bread and the tip of the staff that was in his hand. Fire flared from the rock, consuming the meat and the bread, and the angel of the Lord disappeared. When Gideon realized that it was the angel of the Lord, he exclaimed, Alas, sovereign Lord, I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. If you do that, the penalty is death. The Lord said to him, Peace, don't be afraid, you're not going to die. So Gideon built an altar there. Now, Gideon still wasn't prepared to believe and God was grooming him for a task as he does with each of us. As I said before, we are RACEs. We sand down and prepare people for the gospel, laying hands on the sick, preaching, praying, crying before God, desiring uh, um, uh, people not to go to hell, um, desiring people to, be, um, uh, to understand that God has made a way for them, for their sins to be forgiven. All of this, we desire, we're sanding people down. We are RACEs. We're sanding them down like I sand a house down. When I sand a house down, I start with the, the well, to start with the floor. If I was doing a polished floor, I get in there with 36p grit, and that's probably one of the lowest, and it cuts up that floor and gets rid of all the old stuff off the floor, and it leaves groove marks in the floor there as I do that, so then I've got to take it up to 60, then up to 80, then up to 120, and, and then 180 even to get a good shine and a gloss on that. And when I prepare it like that, I get it all set and I dust it all down and vacuum it all up, and then I get ready to go with the coats of lacquer. And so I put a coat of lacquer on there and it pulls the grain up, so I run a sander over it again, and then I put another coat in, and sometimes you've got to sand it again and then I put another coat on until it's prepared for the king's use. We do that with people, with our testimonies. We defeat the enemy by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony. It's the word of our testimony. We, we defeat the enemy using the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. God doesn't see the sin underneath the blood. He doesn't see it. He forgets it, he says. He says he forgets it. Are you going to believe him? So that means that if I'm weak, I'm strong. So that means there is hope for all of us to be, to glorify God in our walks and, and to be a testimony in front of people. And all of us are important. Jesus is ahead. He needs the body to function right down to the little toe. And, and, and yeah, I, I'm the little toe this morning. Here I am, the little toe this morning, preaching the gospel. So, um, what happened was, just to cut a long story short, Gideon still didn't quite believe. He wanted to make sure that this was the right thing to do. He had to step up from where he was, threshing that wheat and hiding there and threshing that wheat. He had to step up a few levels to believe God. And see, half the time, the problem we have, and I think we heard this morning, is faith. Faith is the substance. Faith is the stuff that God treasures within us. 
And it takes faith to step up and to step into the shoes that God has set for us. He needed to believe more, so he put the fleece down. And there were, there, he, he said to him, he said to God, I'll put this fleece down. Now what I want to happen is if the, if the, uh, if the, um, the fleece is wet and the ground is dry around it, then I know you, it's you talking to me. So one night he put the fleece out and the next day that's what happened. The fleece was wet, drenching wet, but the ground was dry. And he still, could, he still didn't believe even though he saw that. He said, well, look, I'll put it out again tomorrow and I want the fleece to be dry and the ground wet. Or vice versa, one way or the other. And so he did that and that's exactly what happened. So then in that strength, he amassed an army of 32,000 warriors. And he was going to go and destroy the Midianites with 32,000 and God said, that's too many. He said, uh, Israel will think it's because of their strength that they won the fight. So he said, uh, tell the, those that don't really want to be there to go. 22,000 took off. 22,000. So they left, and there was 10,000 left, and God said, there's still too many. 10,000. So he said, uh, we'll do a test in the waters. So we go down, and you watch them and put them in two lots, two groups. Those that get down with their two hands and bring water up to their mouths, put to one side, and those that lap the water with one hand, put to another group. Now what actually happened was, to, 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 to lap the water with two hands, you had to put your armour and your shield, your shield and your sword down on the ground. The other lot kept their shield and their sword in one hand and lapped up with the other. And that's the ones that God wanted. He wanted those ones. He said, you keep those, those that's the army. There was only 300 of them. But they were the tough nuts. Gideon went on with the 300 and he totally, with God's help, totally destroyed the, Gideon, the, um, the, the enemy right down to, they, they, took, they took off back to their land and he got them way back there and he took their kings and he killed their kings and he became a judge over Israel. He had 70 sons after that. <laughs> 70 sons. He had several, several wives. And this is the little man that was threshing wheat and hiding in the wine press that God took hold of and he became judge over Israel. What can God do with you? What can he do with me? What can he do? Because he's willing. He's willing to call you out of the wine press. He's willing to be glorified in your life. And there's no excuse. Because we're not all Billy Grahams. We're not all fantastic uh, 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 preachers and evangelists out there. We don't think we are. But in fact, God sees us in that light. I haven't had that flash of walk in my, my 42 years that I've been walking. But you see, I needed to know that when I am weak, he is strong. Yeah. This is eternal stuff. We are pitted against ourselves. God is sending us down. And some of that sanding hurts. It doesn't matter whether... There are stories of people that have gone into hospital like a sister has and been really sick but full of the glory of God and have actually got nurses saved yes. and sick people saved. I've heard of those that are carting the old uh, drip around with the wheels on it to <laughs> pray for somebody in another bed. When we are weak, he is strong. Yes. 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 Amen. Amen. Scripture, Matthew 26, 41. Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. 
In Romans 13, 4, For though he was crucified in weakness, Jesus was crucified in weakness. He came down as flesh. God dwelt in the body. It's interesting. I think about angels. Because they're the part of our family. They are like our relatives. Um, a different form. <coughs> How did God make them? Has he got a factory out there that churns these things out with glorified bodies? <laughs> For what I see in the Bible there, I see these angels are magnificent creatures. Some with wings, some without. They are our brothers and sisters, I guess. They're part of our family. We're part of their family. Yet God created us out of the dust. We were made out of clay, out of the dust, out of the elements of the earth. When he created the earth, he created man out of the dust. And then he desired to have us to be his children. His glory manifested in bodies made from dirt. And he came down and dwelt in a body similar. In the body of dirt. And in his weakness here, he was crucified. Yet he lives by the power of God. For we also are weak in him, but we shall live with him by the power of God towards you. It pleased God to have fellowship with us. And in his weakness of the flesh, he took our sins on the cross and died a horrible death. But he lives forever. And when Stephen, the first martyr, was stoned, he saw Jesus Christ standing on the right-hand side of God and he called him the Son of Man because he was in the same body that he left with. Like us. Yet a glorified body that lasts forever and ever and ever and ever. That's the promise. Eternity. Originally, we were designed to live forever. Now with Jesus Christ and the blood that covers us and the word of our testimony, we have the promise to live forever. And God desires for us to open our mouths and to get out and pray and to give our, give our uh, uh, money out to people that are, are uh, in need. You know, a uh, sister was saying there the other week there in communion there, we can do that. It's easy. You can just ping, 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 ping on the internet and there goes 20 bucks. I see something on TV there and I, every time I see it, they show a picture of uh, these little brides that are being married off to these older people. And you can help by giving $10 a month. Okay. $5 a day of coffee. $5 a day going to work, coffee, $25 a week. That's $100 a month just on coffee. Tens into 100 is 10 times. 10 little girls you can help. What do we do with our money? You see, we spend it on ourselves. We look at our own stuff and say, oh, I can't afford it this time. No, I'm saving money and uh, I'll, I'll have to stop my donation to um, that place down the road there because I'm trying to trying to pay off my bills. But you see, that's not going to mean anything when we get to heaven. God sees every dollar we spend. He's the flashless accountant in the universe. He's a mathematician. He is the mathematician. Everything is worked out. So, what do we do? What are we do? What What are we doing? with the, the hope and the, 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 uh, the promise that God has given us, what are we doing? Are we stepping into the shoes? Are we allowing God to come down and say, hey, mighty warrior, I've got a job for you. Are we down on our knees when we are woken up in the early hours of the morning or do we just roll over and try and get back to sleep? Guarantee most of us try and do that. In uh, Romans, I 
Romans 7 verse 13. So then the law itself is holy and the commandment is holy, right and good. But does this mean that what is good caused my death? By no means. It was sin that did it by using what is good. Sin brought death to me in order that its true nature as sin might be revealed. And so by means of the commandment, sin shown to be even more terribly sinful. We have a conflict within us. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am mortal. Sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do, for I don't do what I would like to do. But instead I do what I hate. Anyone relate to that? Since what I do is what I don't want to do, this shows that I agree that the law is right. So I am not really the one who does the thing. Rather, it is sin that lives in me. I like the uh, Living Bible, the way they actually say stuff. So I'm not really the one who does this thing. So I'm not doing this thing. <laughs> Rather, it's sin that lives in me. I know that good does not live in me. That is in my human nature. For even though the desire to do good is in me, I am not able to do it. I don't do the good I want to do. Instead, I do the evil that I do not want to do. If I do what I don't want to do, this means that I am no longer the one who does it. Instead, it is sin that lives in me. So now I find this law at work. When I want to do what is good, what is evil is the only choice I have. My inner being delights in the law of God, but I see a different law at work in my body. A law that fights against the law which my mind approves of. It makes me a prisoner to the law of the sin which is at work in my body. What an unhappy man I am. Now read it yourselves, guys. What an unhappy... This is Paul speaking. This is the guy that founded all the early churches, most of them, and wrote most of the uh, New Testament. He was a single guy. Uh, some say he was a little bald guy with skinny legs. <laughs> I, I don't know. It doesn't matter. <coughs> What an unhappy man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is taking me to death? Thanks be to God who does this through our Lord Jesus. This then is my condition. On my own I can serve God's law only with my mind while my human nature serves the law of sin. Then he goes on in chapter 8 and says, Now there is no condemnation to those who walk in Christ Jesus, who walk every day in the spirit of the Lord. There is no condemnation if you're walking in his spirit see even though as I'm saying we're pitted we're pitted up against ourselves we live in it the body of sin yet God's going to glorify this body <coughs> at some stage because my desire is to be like him I don't want I don't want to be the sinful guy always thinking about wrong things but hey there is a black dog and a white dog inside of us fighting, yapping and biting each other. It says that the Spirit of God lusts against the flesh. So the Spirit of God is jealous of His stuff within us. And the body itself desires us to go to hell. Paul had this problem. David, King David had this problem. Even, even Gideon probably had the same issues. I mean, hey, he ended up with several wives and 70 sons. I don't know whether the law was there at that particular time. I guess it was, that you were only meant to have one wife. But hey, he wasn't the only one that did that. So he had issues. Now what I'm saying, what I want, the whole purpose of this preaching this morning is to say, we had no excuse if God says, when we are weak, He is strong in us. So we can all aspire to be uh, the, the great preacher or the great evangelist. Yet half the time when you actually get up there and, uh, and, and, um, and are the, uh, the highly revered uh, evangelist or preacher, you end up with a big head. So you've got more than the problem that the weak guy down the bottom end who, who aspires to be like that, but knows 
this scripture here, when I'm weak, then you are strong in me. That means that if I've done the wrong thing yesterday, there's nothing stopping me from laying hands on the sick today and seeing them heal. Okay? If I had a hard day and argued with my wife yesterday, 